kind of hear a Long Island accent, but you've, you've done a lot to just, you probably went for surgery on that too. But. Well, my mother was born in Brooklyn, so, you know, <laughs> whenever I would talk to her, I, I start to sound more Brooklynese. <laughs> what is your, what is your story? What is the journey for you? Well, I, I was born in Brooklyn. Uh, my dad was in the military, so we lived in Texas, Oklahoma, and Kansas on military bases, and then came back to Nassau County. We were in the original Levittown, uh, moved to Plainview, and then when I was in third grade, we moved to Bellport, which is in Suffolk County, very rural area on the water, much like uh, Talbot County and Easton. And then eighth grade, we moved to Patchog, the next town uh, west, and uh, graduated high school there. And then went to college at my dad's alma mater in South Dakota. And uh, so I always told people I was a cultural exchange student. <laughs> uh, and ended up uh, marrying a girl from uh, Aberdeen, South Dakota, and spent 18 years uh, in South Dakota. Uh, I, I graduated with a teaching degree. Uh, I had a history major and a minor in driver's ed, because in those days you always had to have a minor in driver's ed. And then uh, I worked my way into retail. I worked in retail in high school and college. Uh, became a county assessor in Brown County and then got recruited to uh, Huron, South Dakota as a city assessor and spent uh, a total of six years in government. Uh, when I was in Huron, I started my own appraisal business. And of course, for those who are old enough to remember Jimmy Carter, uh, interest rates uh, went uh, to 16% for houses and 24% for businesses. And so I was back substitute teaching when the uh, chamber exec left and a few people came to me and said, you know, I, I know you're a member of the chamber and you're running the government affairs committee. We think this would be a good job for you. And so I applied and in February of uh, 1981, I became the president CEO of the uh, Huron Area Chamber of Commerce and their development corporation and spent, th oh. spent three years. We had an industrial park and those days uh, Bill Jankla was the governor and Rudy Purpose was the governor of Minnesota and we had the border wars. Right. And so we were recruiting Minnesota businesses to South Dakota because in South Dakota we had no corporate income tax, no personal income tax. And we, as a former assessor, I had worked with uh, the development corporation of businesses, we had a five-year discretionary tax plan. So if you built a new building, we'd only tax 25% of your assessment. Mm. First two years, then 50-50, 75, and then the last year, 100%. And it was uh, it was a great incentive. Mm. And we, we would build 10,000 square foot steel buildings, one door and a floor, all dirt. And when we recruited somebody, then we would customize the buildings for them. And so that really got me into understanding economic development. I work with some very bright individuals on the board who own major companies mm -hmm. and uh, had uh, unbelievable amount of uh, business experience. And then I was recruited, uh, U U.S. Chamber sent my name down to North Platte, Nebraska in 1984. Uh, I ended up going there and running the chamber Development Corporation and Convention of Visitors Bureau, and did that for ten years, and it was uh, it was a great time. We were uh, North Platte is the home of the Bailey Classification Yard. It's Union Pacific's major railroad yard. Uh, at one time, they had 1980 2,400 employees. When I got there, they were down to 1,800 employees, and you know businesses were suffering, and it was it was a difficult time. But we got a lot of things accomplished. Uh, we owned an industrial park and found out that we had a $600,000 note that was due in nine months, and we were paying 16% interest, and uh, 223,000 special assessments. And we worked uh, very hard to see what options were, and we finally got the, the town's utility to purchase the land, and uh, we became the uncompensated agents for filling the industrial park. And that worked out very well. Yeah. And I spent 10 years uh, working with everybody. Uh, I enjoyed the tourism part. Uh, we worked very hard to stop tourists on Interstate 80 for one more night. We had 1,300 motel rooms in town. And 
we were halfway between Denver and Omaha. And we had lots of, uh, lots of different activities. We had uh, five uh, court uh, softball for girls, so we could bid those kinds of uh, tournaments. We had, uh, I think, 26 pits for pitching horseshoes. We had an Olympic pool outside for swim events. And so a lot of times we would go to uh, these organizations, and we'd go to their conventions, and we'd actually bid to bring them to our community. I uh, had the opportunity once to go to uh, what they call NTA Marketplace in Montreal, uh, where uh, all the bus tour companies would go. And then we'd each have six minutes to pitch our community. Uh, okay. So that was, that was quite an experience. You also had the hooping craze, didn't you? Uh, we did, we had, yes. Uh, Nebraska has that, a lot of those. In Kearney, which is 100 miles to the east of us, they have a big festival. Uh, in North Platte, we had the Wild West Arena, uh, which would seat 6,000 people. And we had a nine day Wild West celebration every year. Oh, okay. And they would bring celebrities in. So we, we saw Wilford Brimley one year and uh, you know, just, just a host of different celebrities. Yeah. It was a great opportunity. Uh, we also uh, hosted President Reagan in his last year uh, as uh, President of the United States. He was trying to help the governor, uh, Kay Orr, get reelected. And so got a chance to have lunch mm -hmm. with him and be on the dais. Uh -oh. uh, we had Bob Hope. Uh, there was a, back in World War II, troop trains were coming across the United States. And the women heard that the National Guardsmen were coming from Nebraska. So they met the train, brought food, brought cakes, everything else. Turned out they were from Kansas. But they decided to meet every troop train that came across the United States. And so uh, I was there during the 50th anniversary of what they called the canteen. And our mayor had uh, connections with Mutual of Omaha. Uh, and he was able to get Bob Hope, as he came across the United States, to drop in our community. And uh, that was pretty exciting was experience. Say, how did you get to the Eastern Shore? Well, I, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce always would post a listing of different opportunities. And uh, when I left North Platte, before I left North Platte, uh, I actually went to work for a company that had a $286 million contract tariff with AT&T when they broke up uh, the regional Bell operating companies. And I spent a year with them as the Midwest regional sales manager. We opened up uh, an operation in North Platte with 104 people, and then a second operation, Fremont, Nebraska, with 100 people. And driving back and forth across the state and trying to manage two operations for one year was long enough for me. It was my, I always say that's my HR experience. Uh, but it was, once again, it was, a, it was a great opportunity to learn. And uh, I went to Kansas uh, to manage Chamber of Commerce down there. And it was a unique, uh, it was Great Bend, Kansas, another unique little community. They had a former B-29 base. Mm -hmm. And I was there during the celebration of uh, World War II and uh, the pilot from the Enola Gay uh, Colonel Tibbetts actually was our guest for a special banquet, and uh, we had a we had a great time. But the part of the B-29 base was active runway and taxiway, but we had another part that actually the chamber owned two exposition buildings on, 15,000 and 25,000 square feet. Mm -hmm. And Western Kansas Manufacturers Association out of Dodge City, every other year would have their show there. It was one of the 10 largest agricultural shows in the United States. So we'd have 300 volunteers and we had uh, two and a half miles of runway and taxiway. We had 700 exhibitors mm. who come to our community uh, during the course of that show. Mm. And so it was, uh, once again, uh, I had uh, worked in college and uh, ran forklifts, so I, I got to help uh, chain up equipment, take them off of trucks, and so we did three days before and three days after the show, uh, and and really built a lot of great relationships with other people. And from there, uh, my wife and I had told uh, the folks there we'd be there five years, uh, and we started looking, and the U.S. Chamber had listed uh, the Talbot County Chamber of Commerce as having an opening. And so we put a resume in, 
and uh, got an invitation to come here in December of 1999 and be interviewed and found out we were I was one of the two individuals that they invited to the community. Uh, I met in the morning for breakfast with some of the community leaders. I met uh, the chamber board, uh, was taken to the country club and uh, had lunch with some more community leaders. And I was taken in a car and, and driven around and the person who was driving me around was showing me all the waterfront homes. And I said, this is really nice, but I know what you're paying, so to show me where the real people live. <laughs> and, uh, and really, really felt good about the interview and uh, got a call in January and uh, offered me the opportunity to come here. And so I moved here March, uh, started March 1st of 2000. And my wife came in April and uh, we, we spent our first year in a rented house and, and then the next year we were lucky enough to get in one of Can Hank Corbin's new homes. Okay. And from there uh, we, we spent about two and a half, three years, sold it, bought another house in town, sold that and then moved into a town home. And we're, we're uh, at Dixon Square, which is an infill project. We've been there 18 years now and uh, just enjoying I our time. I love that spot. Yeah, it's perfect. It's on rails to trails. Yeah. You can walk downtown. Yeah. Uh, Northeastern Park is close by. John Ford Park. Yeah. Uh, it's it's it just a great it. location. Can't beat it. Yeah. Um, so um, you spent uh, 20 years at the chamber, is that right? That's right. Yeah, I retired uh, almost three years ago in December. So I guess the question uh, that I'm going to be asking everyone, but um, I know that you've been civically involved since you got here, uh, but there's a big difference between civically involved or engaged right. and running for public office. And I want to know about what what motivated you to to kind of uh, offer your support for that kind of program. Well, uh, eight years ago is when I first got elected to the town council, and at that time. Uh, had been advocating for the, for the chamber, both with the town council and county council, on a number of issues. And one of the laments that I heard was there really aren't very many people on either board that had business experience. And so I talked with uh, my board of directors and said I would like to run for office and living in the first ward that would be the right place to run from. And they said will support you. And so I went out and campaigned and uh, was uh, lucky enough to get elected in 2015. And then the opportunity came back again three years later. Uh, the first time I had opposition, second time I didn't. And so I'm concluding uh, my eight year term on the council. Uh, last year, Mayor Willie, who you know is to be commended for his service to the community, uh, you know, half century uh, with the fire department plus and a third of a century in town government uh, indicated uh, when he was, uh, we had a party for him to celebrate being the longest serving mayor in the history of Easton, that this was going to be the end of his, his reign. He, he was going to be done and was not going to run again in 2023. And I started looking around and saying, you know, there's some things I'd like to see done and I, I think uh, at this point in time, uh, I'm going to test the water, see what people think. And then I started uh, about a month after that saying, you know, I think I'm going to run uh, for, uh, for mayor. Mm. And so that's really what the genesis of, of running for mayor was about. When, when you look at that decision, what, what are that, those three or four issues that uh, you want to take on? as mayor versus a council position? Sure. Well, the, ma the mayor has broad authority. Uh, the council, of course, is the legislative body, and, and the mayor runs the day-to-day -day operations of the town. Uh, all department heads report to the mayor, and, and the, the mayor really is the captain of the ship. Mm -hmm. uh, I look at the hospital situation, and I've been involved uh, going back to 2006 uh, with uh, the medical community on, on various issues and uh, am frustrated, very frankly, that we don't have a new regional medical center at this time. When the University of Maryland uh, bought our facility, uh, 
they made us a promise that they were going to build us a new me regional medical center. But first, they had to take care of their circumstances in Dorchester County in Cambridge and get that squared away, which they've done. Uh, Denton was underserved, so they built a facility in Denton. Uh, they had to do something in Queen Anne's County, and so they did that in Chester. And then they had to go up uh, to Kent County and figure out what they were going to do with that hospital. And those folks fought, frankly, very hard to keep that hospital. And it's now a new rural model, so I, you know, I give them a lot of credit. But the last piece in the puzzle is getting this new regional hospital. And uh, I thought it was, uh, it was great that... Governor Hogan suggested that $100 million be put into the budget to get started, uh, but that was only a suggestion because he was going out and Governor Moore was coming in, mm -hmm. and it was up to Governor Moore and his staff mm -hmm. to determine what their budget would be. And it wasn't put into, that, into the proposed new budget. And so started talking to our legislators and, and other people who are knowledgeable. In fact, uh, I met last week with Ken Kozell uh, to talk through some issues and concerns of mine and said so how do we get how do we get money into a supplemental budget what kind of lobbying pressure what kind of uh, pressure do we need I know things are being done behind the scenes uh, I sit in uh, the Eastern Shore delegation which uh, Chris Adams is the chair of has a, a Friday meeting and you can go on Zoom and you can follow that meeting, which I did last week, and uh, found out that maybe 10, 000, 10, excuse me, $10 million was going to be put into a supplemental budget. And so that prompted me to call Ken Kozell and say, Ken, what do we really need at this time to, to get this rolling? And he said, well, we need a commitment from the community. We need some money from the state. And I asked about uh, the foundation because we have a substantial amount of money in the foundation. And he said, you know, some of it's restricted, some of it's unrestricted. So there is some money there. Uh, but uh, looking for the town and the county to step up mm -hmm. and try to raise $50 million in the five county region. Mm -hmm. And that made a lot of sense. And so my concern is that as a council member uh, from the town of Easton, I haven't heard any discussions about these kinds of things from the mayor's office. Mayor meets with Ken Kozell, as does uh, the county. And Chuck Callahan before that, it was Corey Pack. And I know uh, sitting at county council meetings, Corey Pack has talked about how he had told the other council members about the meetings. Well, as council members, mayor has never come back to us and told us about the meetings. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm big into two things. Number one is sharing information. And number two uh, is transparency and keeping people involved. Having, for 38 years, had to report to boards of directors, I learned very quickly, you know, do not bring them bad news if you haven't prepared them. And make sure that... Uh, you know, if the budget's good, the meeting's good. But if the finances aren't good, uh, the meeting's not going to be a lot of fun. And, and there are things with the town that I think we can do better. Uh, as a town council member, I don't get my packet of materials for a Monday meeting until Friday. That really doesn't give me enough time to dig in and, and get questions answered from staff and, and really ask for information that I think uh, is important for the public to know about. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes I will ask for things to be held over so that I can get more information. Uh, the other thing is we do not get a P&L statement. And every board I've ever been on gets a P&L statement. All we get are the bills. So I think structurally there's some things that we could do a much better job of sharing between the council and the mayor's office. And, uh, and so you know, I'm committed, and I've, I've told other council members, and I'll tell anybody who will listen to me, that we need to, ha we need to have more open discussions, more dialogue. We need to prepare the council better for votes and, and make sure that they really know what's going on. And, and I think that's really important. I think a good example of that 
is uh, in February we were told that the seven million dollar bond recreation bond that was uh, we got uh, we had three and a half million dollars left and we had to spend them by October 28th. I find that frustrating. Uh, plus the bond said we were going to build a waterside park and uh, it talked about building an indoor recreational facility which has never come before the council for approval mm -hmm. and also to remodel a town hall. Now the park isn't done and won't be done I'm told for another two to three years. Mm -hmm. uh, no recreational facilities ever been and no drawings ever come before us as a council mm -hmm. so the, nothing's happening there and we did do a remodel on the town hall so now all of a sudden we get thrown a bunch of projects you know here's 250,000 here here's 125 to put some equipment there and I, I really frankly didn't think that was the best way to manage those resources and to find out in February that's got to be done by October 28th puts an extremely large strain on, on our engineering staff mm -hmm. and our construction staff. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other part of that is we have private businesses that are out there building buildings and everything else and all anytime that's done it's got to go through uh, a bunch of approvals and uh, our engineering staff has to be involved in every one of those. Yeah. So I think we're putting a strain on people yeah. unnecessarily. Um. I don't know if you saw this, but we have, uh, last week we started a, a survey on Easton's top issues. Um, people have a couple more days to, to do that right. poll, but we're, we'll probably get 400 responses, which is really healthy. Yeah, it is. Um, and um, uh, there's no secret here, the number one issue that, that emerges from that is growth. I mean, there's some subcategories, right. but growth is the the major one. Do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, it's a balancing act, isn't it? Well, first of all, uh, I always tell people we have a green belt self-imposed on the town of Easton. Most people don't know where, where that is or what that is. And we decided a long time ago we'd only grow so far. But I think we can tweak our development process. Uh, I think we should, as a, as a town, we should say this is where we want these kinds of things as opposed to a developer coming in and saying I'm thinking of buying this land and this is what I want to do. Uh, before we even get to the Planning Commission we need to be when a project is, is brought before us we need to be talking with the county and see how it impacts them. We need to talk to the school district. If it's on a state highway we need to talk to state highway. I just, I just feel as though the communication is not going back and forth and, and I, I've been going for the last two years to as many town uh, planning commission meetings, historic district commission meetings, mm -hmm. park board meetings, you name it, uh, to try to get a sense of how they operate and what we could do better. You know, uh, you talk about how do you master plan your community? We don't have a master plan for parks. Uh, we're acquiring parks, but we don't have a master plan. We don't have a master plan for housing, for workforce housing. Now, you, there's all kinds of definitions. We're talking about the people who serve us in this community, who work for our county and our town, who work in our school districts, who are police officers and, and work in the fire department or volunteer for the fire department or an EMS. We don't have a real good strategic plan. And one of the things that we don't do is uh, the mayor and council don't sit down with uh, our executives in each of the departments and do a strategic plan each year. I'm used to doing that with our boards of directors so that you have a game plan, you know where you're going. So a lot of thing, times we're reacting to things that are happening around us. Mm -hmm. I think we should be much more proactive and we working with our citizens should say this is appropriate in our community and this is not appropriate and then manage the development. I'm very concerned about the Oxford Corridor. I don't want to see that become a mess. I don't want to see unlimited traffic. And so, you know, we've got some projects that are coming before us and I have some ideas and thoughts on those. And when the time's appropriate, when it comes before us, uh, I'll make what I think is a, an appropriate statement on those issues. 
Um, we've, we've got a lot of material. I guess uh, one thing I ask everyone is, what do you think is the differential? What is the, the thing that you're bringing to the table that perhaps the other candidates are not in this role as mayor? Well, first of all, I've lived in different places and gotten to see what things work and, and what doesn't work. And so I have a little broader view. Uh, secondly, I've, I've been very involved in the legislative process. In South Dakota, I was the head of the Assessors Association. Uh, we got rid of uh, what we called the personal property tax, which was a liar's tax. Mm. Uh, and that was one of my goals when I went in there. Uh, I've lobbied legislatures. I was on the state chamber legislative committee for 17 years. And I think the mayor should be the number one lobbyist for the town of Easton. Should be in Annapolis. Should be working behind the scenes with the governor's office. I also think, besides our senator and, and our two delegates, we need to have uh, somebody lobbying for us all the time. Mm. We need to be looking at as many grants as possible for this community. Uh, I think we just need to, we need to look forward and, and we need to move our community forward. And the other thing we need to do is we really need to make people feel that they've been included in our community. And I've talked about this before. Reverend Davis and I have had many discussions about this. There are a lot of people here who uh, felt the sting of segregation. And it's still very, very close in their memory. And, and I see that when I go to different events. And we need to figure out a way to, to bring the minority communities in to make them feel welcome, uh, to make them feel they want to come downtown, that there's something for them to do. Uh, I sit on the Chesapeake Multicultural Resource Board, and so you know I'm getting a sense of what our newest immigrants to the community are are going through, and and the work that's being done to help them become part of the community. And having been on a number of different boards over the years, I think I have a really good view of of what's going on in the community and who the people are to gather when we have a problem and work together. Um, uh, at the end of all these, I give the candidates an opportunity to talk directly to the community. Uh, I mean, are there things that you want them to know about your background or your positions on things that we haven't touched on? I think we pretty much hit most of the things. You know, I, I'm for limited growth. I think there, there's a place for some development, but I don't want to see us become like Long Island became or Glen Burnie or any, any other place like that. And, and I, just because I worked for the Chamber of Commerce didn't mean th that I wanted to see our community uh, grow in such a manner that none of us want to live here anymore. We all came here for a reason, uh, because of the quality of life. And I think we've got to work very hard to preserve that quality of life. Uh, the other thing I didn't mention is uh, I'm on the Talbot Historical Society Board and I'll become the president May 1st. Yeah. So, so, you know, uh, I'm learning more and more about the historical perspective of our community and really respect those individuals who have been here who want to protect it. Uh, it's important uh, to keep our history alive. Yeah, it sure is. Al, thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate Dave. it.